Thank you very much. Um, I want to welcome everyone to, to Pennington today and uh, thank Catherine for giving me this opportunity. I will tell you, I've been speaking for over 30 years and nothing is more anxiety provoking than being in front of so many women, I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> She also mentioned that uh, many people don't know what goes on behind the walls of Pennington. Well, executive director, that's my biggest fear. I don't know what's going on in the walls most of the time. But uh, actually, what I wanted to do is give you an update on Pennington, uh, what we do, what our mission is, a little bit about diabetes, and then I'm going to talk about some of the, the clinical trials uh, that we're doing. We, we have so many trials, I'm going to highlight those that may be of interest to you. So first and foremost, um, how many of you really know about the history of Pennington? Raise your hand or not many? Okay. Well, we're in our 25th year, and uh, Pennington is a separate campus of LSU. Uh, it's, uh, again, because of a gift from uh, Claude and Irene Pennington, $125 million uh, in the 1980s, which to develop this nutrition center. Uh, since that time, Pennington has uh, really devoted its work to obesity, type 2 diabetes, and really has a storied and international reputation uh, with type 2 diabetes and obesity. So when I tell people, people in Europe know more about Pennington than individuals across the street, that's what we're facing here. Uh, because we have scientists and uh, uh, junior faculty and trainees coming from around the world because of the reputation here. We've had four executive directors and in June, I took over for Dr. Uh, Steve Heimsfeld to kind of lead the center. So what do we do? Well, uh, right now, this is the, uh, the clinical, let's see, I guess it's mouse. Here we go. This is the original buildings at Pennington over 25 years ago. This is the administration, the scientific building. And now what we hear, we're in the foundation, but we've had remarkable growth. We have a basic science and core lab building that opened up over 10 years ago. We, we still call it the new basic science building. Uh, it's like the new bridge here in Baton Rouge, over 50 years old. The clinical research building, which is just a state-of-the-art facility. And now we have an imaging center uh, and a new director coming in this summer. Imaging as far as MRI scans. You've heard a lot about that in Dr. Keller's talk. We actually, just this past January, opened up a new pediatric obesity and diabetes wing. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a moment. But diabetes is no longer just a disease of adults. It's now spreading to the children, and that's incredibly worrisome for us. So for right now, our mission is we like to say we want to lead the world in eliminating a chronic disease, a chronic disease such as obesity and diabetes and all the complications that go along with that. And when we say discover the triggers of disease, this has to do with prevention. We want to understand what happens to the body that allows you to develop or, or, or progresses to diabetes or heart disease. And understanding that allows for prevention. So all our research is interconnected. In fact, obesity and diabetes, you know, is related to heart disease. But how many of you know that obesity and its components are related to increased risk of developing cancer. Or what you heard in the prior talk, now some of the brain changes that you see in obesity and diabetes may be early dementia. So it's really interconnected, and that's why our focus has been on this particular condition. So right now, we're over about 500 faculty and staff, uh, 80 uh, 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 scientists and uh, uh, several physician scientists, and so we have about uh, 19 core facilities and 50 research laboratories. Each individual is in charge of their uh, particular lab. So what we focus on, we focus on have been traditionally nutrition, obesity, diabetes, and what we refer to as healthy aging. So this is enough, right? But we're actually in a good position at Pennington because when you look at the state's problems, when you look at what we spend on chronic disease. And once again, chronic disease is a condition that you develop and will stay with you for the remainder of your life. Again, the obesity, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the cholesterol disorders. Well, right now, it's been estimated that obesity, tobacco, and this other chronic disease, and if you link chronic disease, hypertension from obesity, diabetes from obesity, heart disease from obesity, 
you're now talking about $3 billion in Louisiana spent on these each year. So why we focus on this? Well, this is a map of the United States. And what I want to highlight is this area in red. This is not the political red and blue state. Okay? This signifies the increased obesity in our particular nation. And you can see there is what we refer to as an obesity or diabetes belt. Now, the problem nationwide is bad enough. But when now you talk about what's happening, particularly here in Louisiana, we've had an increase in diabetes, really, that's beginning to skyrocket worldwide in this country and in every state. And as bad as the problem is across the nation, it seems to be particularly worse here in Louisiana. Because now, when you talk about 8.5% of the population with diabetes, Louisiana and the surrounding areas around Baton Rouge are 50% above the national average. So we have a problem nationwide. It's particularly problematic here in Louisiana. And I'll also share with you that our state is, has the second highest mortality due to diabetes in the country. So this is a, a, a problem and one we need to address. All right. So what is it about diabetes? Well, first and foremost, if you have the disease, it needs to be treated. You can divide the complications, the problem of diabetes, into what we refer to as small vessel complications, why you need to control the blood sugar. Diabetes is one of the leading causes of non-traumatic blindness in the country. Half the cases of kidney disease and dialysis is due to diabetes, and it's one of the number one causes of amputations. But seven out of 10 people with diabetes will ultimately die of what we refer to as large vessel disease, stroke and heart disease and peripheral vascular disease. So the small blood vessel problems, that's why you need to control the sugar. Research has shown blood sugar is responsible for the small vessel problems. The large blood vessel, well, that's blood sugar, cholesterol, blood pressure, and genetics, and unfortunately something I can't control is stress, but uh, it's all related. All right, some, some of the other things we do here at Pennington, we are tightly connected with other academic organizations, and we have several major initiatives going on here. What we're very proud of is what we refer to as our Louisiana Clinical and Translational Science Center. Essentially, this is a $20 million grant that spans the state our partners are as far north as Shreveport at the LSU Medical Center in Shreveport, here in Baton Rouge with the Healthcare Services Division, LSU, in New Orleans, the Medical Center at LSU, Tulane Medical Center, Xavier Research Children's, and we actually have a partner in South Carolina. One unified research structure. Not every center can do it alone. So we try to leverage resources where expertise in Shreveport or New Orleans can help us here at Pennington, and likewise, we reciprocate. So that's really uh, the, uh, the emphasis behind this LACATS grant, we call the LACATS Center, which is based here at Pennington. Dr. Peter Kazmarzik leads a quality control program throughout the state, linking the hospitals and the clinics that try to improve patient outcomes by improving quality measures in clinical care. Many of you may have uh, understood that last, in December, we announced $16 million in new Department of Defense funding. And the Department of Defense, performance for our soldiers, nutrition, has been, and the Department of Defense has been one of the leading sponsors of research here at Pennington. In fact, our longest sponsor since the inception of the center. And actually, we're doing a lot. We're working with the state as far as this uh, study called Heads Up, a weight management and bariatric surgery program here at the center. So we have a lot going on here at the center as far as addressing obesity, diabetes, and chronic disease. So let's get back to diabetes. And I'm going to show you some very scary statistics. So once again, this is the prevalence, which means the percent of the population with diagnosed diabetes in 1994, the bluer the state, the larger the number of patients with diabetes. So you can see then, in 1994, Louisiana, Mississippi, at the top of the list, right? So let's, let's progress. This is 1994. 
1995, you can see that a few more states lighter blue, which means a little bit more diabetes. This is 1996, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2, 3, and 4. Now I'll show you where we are today. I just showed you those statistics in the state. So you could almost say, well, you know what? Diabetes appeared to be in Louisiana, Mississippi and spread throughout the country. What is going on? And I think we'd have to track the increase in Cajun restaurants. <clears throat> so we refer to this as the gumbo effect, right? Uh, anyway, not we don't want to talk too lightly about this because this is a major problem, but it just emphasizes diet, genetics, inactivity, and the problem we have nationwide. All right, so you don't wake up with diabetes one morning. In fact, what happens is you go through this period of prediabetes. And we do know that the last thing to increase before you become diabetic is the blood sugar. By the time you develop a blood sugar increase, you're well on your way. So we know there's a stage of prediabetes. And again, how many of you know you're fasting blood sugar? Okay. Anything less than 100 is good. 100 and 125 is prediabetes. Anything greater than that would be diabetes. But we know there's a period of time where you become prediabetic. And this is where what we call insulin inefficiency in your body. I'll explain that in just a moment. But long before you become diabetic and the blood sugar becomes abnormal, you essentially compensate. Your body's insulin level, the hormone that controls blood sugar, is actually higher because you're inefficient. And only when the pancreas begins to fail do you become diabetic. So we do know that this period is referred to as prediabetes. And you can have a completely normal sugar, but unfortunately, that's where the heart disease and a lot of the problems begin. So if we look at this prediabetes, here's a study that actually is the women's part of the women's health study, followed people for about 20 years, followed people who remained non-diabetic throughout the study, and then those who were diabetic throughout the study. And then they went back and found those women who became diabetic, and let's look at their risk factors and determine how close they came to becoming diabetic. And what we find is that 15 years before you developed type 2 diabetes, Going from non-diabetic to diabetic, your increased risk for heart disease increased about two and a half fold. At about 10 to 15 years before women develop diabetes, increased about 3.2 fold. Less than 10 years before the women develop diabetes, increased about 3.6 fold. And you can see the risk throughout. What you're beginning to appreciate is long before you develop diabetes, you develop risk factors that promote your risk for heart disease. And once you develop the blood sugar abnormalities, then you start developing the eye, kidney, and nerve problem. So what is it about the pre-diabetic? Well, it has to do with weight and where your weight is located. We refer to it as the apple and pear shape. Apple, men are traditionally apple shaped. They have more fat from the waist as opposed to the hip. Women are traditionally pear shaped. But those individuals who are more apple-shaped as, as assessed by this waist-to-hip ratio or your belt size are more likely to develop the problems. Again, and what this represents, if we do a scan, and this is a scan, and here's your umbilicus, and here again is your spine, and all this white is this fat around the intestine. It's called visceral fat, and this is referred to as your subcutaneous fat. So if I squeeze on the outside of my abdomen, that is the subcutaneous fat. But what's around my intestine is the visceral fat. That appears to be the culprit. When you look at, again, a type 2 diabetic, look at the amount of visceral fat. And that it has direct implications for altering like function of the liver and, and altering your efficiency of your body. So, this is a particular study that looked at individuals in their 50 and just separated them on whether they were apple and pear-shaped. Those who were pear-shaped and had a low waist circumference had a low risk for developing diabetes. Those who had an increased waist circumference, an increased belt side, an increased risk. And this is related to, once again, the conditions being interrelated. So obesity is related, and if you're inactive, 
and you're getting older, and I can't think of anyone in Baton Rouge who is older and inactive. I just can't see it. But if you know someone who happens to be getting older and is inactive, you may, they may want to know this, because this leads to your body's, it's called insulin inefficiency. This is a prebiotic condition. You can't feel this. You can be measured, you can't feel it. But this is a condition that prior to diabetes is related to abnormal blood cholesterol and triglycerides, abnormal blood pressure, high blood sugar eventually, and alters your blood vessel function and eventually leads to heart disease. And having any three of these abnormalities, a slightly increased blood pressure, slightly higher waist circumference, a slightly elevated glucose, a lower protective cholesterol, those factors, any three, are what we refer to as prediabetes or metabolic syndrome. And if you have any three of those, if you don't have any three of those and you follow individuals over time, your chance of heart disease is low. But if you have blood pressure and cholesterol problems and a slight increase in glucose, any three of the five parameters, well, there's your increased risk for heart disease. So treating diabetes is important. Preventing it, the only way we're going to effectively treat diabetes in the future is preventing it. Now here's a big concern of ours, that now we recognize that the adult form of diabetes, as bad as it is when you develop it in middle age, it can be treated and it can be controlled. So diabetes doesn't have to take one day off your life if it's effectively treated. But we do know if left untreated, it will lead to the devastating complications, eye, kidney, and nerve disease. Well now, we find out it's happening in children. In fact, to, to, the Today study was a study, in fact, a number of articles were published in this journal of diabetes care in June. We find out that children that you thought traditionally developed the juvenile onset diabetes, now we're developing the adult form of the condition. And the adult form of the condition is harder to treat. It's more aggressive. This is why that now we have a special program here in pediatric obesity and type 2 diabetes that we hope is going to have uh, imp implications and reach uh, across the state. So this is a major, major uh, initiative for Pennington. So getting back to diabetes, we know that the way to prevent it is to improve your efficiency of your body. Now, so the goals of diabetes uh, is to, if you have it, to effectively treat it, but more so to prevent it. Dr. Bob Ratner, who was, pre who was Chief Scientific Officer of the American Diabetes Association, was here on Tuesday night. And he gave statistics that there's no way we can afford the current diabetes epidemic. It will overwhelm our budget and Medicare budget if we move forward. And the only way to treat it is to prevent it. So our goal here at Pennington is, number one, we have studies on treatment. And we've had landmark studies. We were involved in the diabetes prevention program, which showed that lifestyle, losing weight and exercise, can prevent the disease. We were involved in the look ahead, the dietary studies. And we've developed the DASH diet that Catherine Champagne was uh, involved in. So dietary involvement is important. This is a study, the largest diabetes study ever conducted by the National Institute of Health, and we are a site here. It's called the GRADE trial. If you have anyone in your family who have type 2 diabetes, this study will compare all the known medications. It's what we call comparative effectiveness, which means that, well, this medication may work for this individual, but does it work for the other individual? So we will compare all the medications for type 2 diabetic group if you're over than 30, if you've had diabetes for less than 10 years, if your glucose is poorly controlled, and we have this study, so you may, please tell individuals, we have openings, and this study uh, will provide free medications and care and will work with your physician. So this is called the GRADE trial. Three to four visits per year, uh, a, a, a little compensation, but the major thing is the information you get and the medication. So, we have a treatment study called GRADE. We have a prevention study called D2D, which essentially individuals at or identified as having prediabetes will put you on a vitamin treatment, vitamin D, 
because there's some evidence that vitamin D may be related to prevention. Once again, if uh, your BMI, your body mass index, is greater than 25 in the overweight category, you may qualify. Uh, and really to determine if vitamin D can be important in prevention. So I'm going to highlight a few of the studies. One screening visit and three clinic visits at the beginning of the study, and we'll follow individuals up to four years. Now, other studies we're doing that may be of interest to you is, again, muscle loss. And individuals, particularly women as they age, will lose bone mass and muscle mass. And this is called sarcopenia. So sarcopenia, in your, in your 20s, you have your peak muscle mass. And during aging, your muscle mass declines. Now, this is important because if you could have a certain BMI, how many of you know your BMI? Good, all right? So you could look at your BMI and you go, wow, well, here's a BMI of 23. I'm in actually pretty good shape, 21-year-old female. And here is the, the leg bone, and this is, this is a, essentially your thigh. And this dark is the muscle, and this white is the subcutaneous fat. So this person, you could look and says, well, as a BMI of 24, still has pretty good muscle mass. But then let's say, you say, you know, I've never gained weight over my life. And now you're at 73, and you still have a body, body mass index of 24. Now look at what your leg looks like because of the loss of the muscle mass. And this is important because Glucose, muscle, is the tissue that burns 90% of your blood sugar after meal. It is the major organ that burns blood glucose. So if you have less muscle mass, you'll have a greater likelihood of having abnormalities in blood sugar. And then you combine that with the problems that decrease muscle mass, you're not able to exercise, your endurance, you're not as fit, and functional decline. So it's a, uh, uh, it's a spiral downward. And this is why it's important to know. But well, we have a study called Muscle Mass 2 that we're looking for individuals who are a little bit older and who have diseases such as congestive heart failure and lung disease because that predisposes you to have worse functional problems. And this particular study is going to examine a method to assess body mass, essentially so we can use it for other studies. And actually, you're going to get compensated pretty well during the study because you have to come in and put up with me in the inpatient unit. So uh, my wife says 2100 is not enough for that. So <laughs> it's kind of cheap compared to what she has to put up with. All right, other things, just to let you know, we run the gamut for women's health. In addition to uh, studying older women who have lost of muscle mass, those that may be pre-diabetic. Uh, Leanne Redmond has a focus here on reproductive endocrinology in Women's Health Laboratory. Again, we have over 40 studies going on here at Pennington. I encourage you to get to the website and look at what's available. Some of her studies are in what was called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Interestingly, this is a condition that's associated with prediabetes and with insulin inefficiency. And so she has a study that studying young women with this condition that predisposes to diabetes. And this is called the PULSE study, a study which uses medication, exercise training, dietary restriction. Once again, I'm just introducing the concept that we have studies here on women's health. Please visit the website if you have someone in this particular category. Pregnancy. We know now about the problems of pregnancy. Obesity is a problem per se, but women who are obese and get pregnant they have other complications during pregnancy. There are now new international guidelines for pregnancy. So in this regard, we have studies. And Dr. Redmond's group and other investigators here have studies expecting success, trying to manage weight gain during pregnancy, trying to manage with either physician-directed, a uh, personalized weight management face-to-face, -face, or with the smartphone technology. So very innovative ways to manage weight gain during pregnancy. If you know of women who are pregnant, please let them visit the website. Again, we're looking for individuals for this very important study. Um, after delivery, women who are obese, and once again, the, the problems are recovering from pregnancy, the, the uh, information about breastfeeding, not uh, being active after, after pregnancy, keeping the weight on, um, and these are important. Uh, cognitive changes, mental health. So even we have studies during pregnancy and actually there are studies after pregnancy 
dealing with these issues. Once again, part of the reproductive program here and dealing with uh, a study called EMOM. So this is just a sampling of the studies we have. So what I wanted to say is, number one, um, I finished within 30 minutes, Catherine. <clears throat> okay. Because uh, there's nothing more scary than speaking in front of women is the wrath of Dr. Champagne, trust me. <clears throat> Uh, but please visit our website. If you have any interest in our studies, we have on the website uh, information on research participants. It spans from pregnancy to postpartum uh, uh, changes to women in their early life for prediabetes to loss of muscle mass to developing diabetes to prevention. And we, ha we span the lifespan from early age, 20s, up into the 80s. So we have a research sub, uh, study for just about every age. The other thing we do is, again, at Pennington, I'm glad you're here, but please understand what we're trying to do. We, are, we think we're not only a state, but a national resource. And what we do is incredibly important, and we try to educate, we try to disseminate the information, we try to address, really, the, re the prevalent problems of our state. And I'll put in a, uh, another plug. One of the uh, community symposiums we have, we have another one coming up on Tuesday night, free to the public. This is just backyard remedies. We're going to have some fun. We have a natural product center here at Pennington, and we're going to show you some of the interesting things, some Louisiana plants that, uh, uh, and some of the health benefits for the Louisiana plants. So with that, I really appreciate your, uh, your interest and your attention in coming to Pennington, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you.